Uh, I'm Ben Hughes, I'm clearly from Etsy. Um, I'm here to talk about poning all the Internet of Things for fun and profit, not really. Uh, I just thought if I did an Internet of Things slide first, everyone would be like, God, no. So when I did a defensive security talk, everyone would be really for that because everyone's bored of Internet of Things talks. Um, Got to say, it's good being in Canada where you do measurements properly because I live in the US. Um, I'm not so pleased about the temperature. Um, I obviously work at Etsy. We're an online marketplace that deals in vintage and handmade goods. Um, I hear the holiday seasons are coming up. We missed your Thanksgiving, um, but there's other ones coming. Please shop there. Uh, we're a retirement home for burnt out security professionals, so we have a surprisingly large, um, actually like scarily good security team that's better than most like boutique pen test firms because they're like, yeah, I can't be bothered being on the road anymore. Um, no one really cares about this slide. So I'm here to talk about an intro, which I'm doing. Um, laptops, workstations, why they're the bane of everyone's life. Servers, you might have some or you might attack them. Data, which I hear some people have, and then conclusions, otherwise it would just amble off into nothing. Wow, these don't update in time. So the key thing of this talk is we no longer have this really neatly defined border between um, like uh, a secure place and an insecure place. Uh, many people now, I believe, if you have a company, up to one per person have laptops. Um, those are a good thing to attack and the line between inside and out no longer exists. Um, the threat model for securing the front door, which we used to enjoy during the 90s, is no longer relevant because there is no longer a front door. People keep talking about moats as if anyone was alive in the medieval times. Um, as my amazing clip art shows, um, this is cloud thing. I don't know if you have it here because all I see is snow and cold. Um, and like nowadays, you don't go, most people don't attack servers or like most real people don't attack servers. You attack endpoints like uh, laptops are more in, bleh, becoming more common of phones as the malware on Android or Android as we call it, talk earlier, discussed. Um, so um, securing your laptop is a thing. If you, if you don't think you need to secure your laptop, then um, it probably has company data in it. Um, if you're an engineer, you probably have some source code on it, uh, unless you're one of those weird places that doesn't let source code leave site. Uh, it's great for lateral movement. If your laptop doesn't have access to things, then you probably don't need a laptop to work at your job. Um, I'm sure you can think of more reasons why attacking laptops is easier than attacking a filed web server or whatever. Not the web servers are secure, but whatever, different talk. Um, so if any of you use Chrome, uh, I hear it's the coming thing. Uh, Opera just isn't taking off anymore. Then um, Chrome does a real good job at stopping you from getting malware. There's recently been some malvertising, the Kyle and Stan malvertising campaign recently of um, you buy ad space with someone like Google or Facebook or Bing. They serve adverts to you. And like, so you go and search for Text Wrangler, and the first link is not Text Wrangler. It's a paid for ad advertisement to something that then downloads crappy malware to your machine and then kindly installs whatever you ask for on top. Um, and like, this is just to install adware to steal your uh, browser and your search. But if you're willing to pay enough money, like Kyle and Stan, whoever they are, did, you can do more malicious APT, blah, blah, blah. Um, the nice thing about this is Google's motto is don't be evil unless it's for financial profit, in which case it's absolutely fine to take money to uh, do this kind of thing because that's fine, that's fine, despite having an entire browser department designed against this. Um, so one of the cool things we've done at uh, Etsy is dig a really big hole in the ground uh, for DNS sinkholing. And DNS sinkholing is just where you take your uh, like shitty domain that you don't care about, like downloadfast.co, which is super legit. Um, and then you just... In your corporate DNS, you just dump all queries for that to localhost, big shout out to IPv6. Um, or if you want to be real clever, you redirect it to an internal site where you can track and um, monitor this. So we have a landing page to go, you tried to download something crap. Please come and talk to security or help desk and they'll try and make you click on the right thing rather than Google tricking you for money into downloading something malicious. But that's only happened once this week. Um, Really important thing, this will break with DNSSEC, so you can all have to really think long and hard about that, because I know DNSSEC is a big, big thing, used by no one. <laughs> Speaking of used by no one.
I recently did a similar talk in Europe where this slide was not as funny because they have both those things there. Um, but North America is like, we don't want those. We've got loads of IP addresses. We, we made them up to begin with. Um, <laughs> real global of you. Um, so whether IPv6, whether you loathe it or completely indifferent to it, you can still have lots of fun with it, as many will do. Uh, and if you don't think you're using it, then you're probably wrong. If you own a modern telephone, maybe even a BlackBerry, but who knows, no one's ever used one. Um, if you own any Apple kit or like run iTunes, then that will just talk IPv6 to whatever it can. Uh, Netflix is probably the largest IPv6 consumer publisher, I don't know, whatever Netflix do. They're the thing you tunnel to America to to get the decent video. Um, I've heard rumors. Um, so there's been, there's been a bunch of talks by other people. And the basic attack is uh, you can't throw up a DHCP network on IPv4 to steal everyone's traffic. But you can certainly throw up an IPv6 one. Uh, and because of things like Slack, the auto configuration thing, you just go, hey, local network, you can go and talk IPv4 over there. But how about you go and talk IPv6 over here? And most modern stacks will uh, pick v6 before v4. And if you kindly do DHCP v6 and go, hey, here are some domain uh, DNS servers, you'll be like, cool, I talked to those. And then you just return every host you want to intercept. Suddenly everything goes over v6 to that hop. And then you can just translate it back to v4. And now you're man on the middling everyone's traffic. Um, so IPv6 is pretty useful for that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's other uses other than, other than Netflix. Um, you can, in most kit, like Cisco or Juniper, you can disable this with a router advertisement guard, which is the same as you would with DHCP of going like, my DHCP server's here. If anything else says they're a DHCP server, they're full of shit. Don't listen to them. Um, I would suggest turning that on. And if you are an attack team, I would suggest enjoying this. Um, another thing we've been doing is, um, Handing out IDSs to everyone. Uh, what are you saying? It's a big rack mount thing on everyone's desk. It's cabled into their laptop. No, um, from the little example there, PF, because everyone uses Macs. Uh, again, not as funny in Europe, uh, where they have Lenovo's. Who even knows what they are? Um, so just using like PF or IP tables, if you're one of the eight people on a Linux desktop, um, you can just do simple pass logging for a basic, very basic IDS. Uh, where you can go, I'm talking to bad hosts on bad ports, such as like BitTorrent or 31337 because I'm showing my age, or whatever other port you want. Yes, it's not quite a full IDS in the snort sense, but the benefit of this is it isn't full of remote code execution, so you've got to weigh the two up. Um, <laughs> then you take these logs off your endpoints, uh, and then you throw them in like Elk or whatever you log to. If you can afford Splunk, you do that. If not, you just have money fights. Um, <laughs> This is not, despite what it says there, this is not a genuine Etsy data center. None of that's handmade. Um, <laughs> except maybe the, that delicious sweater. Do you say sweater or jumper? Sweater. Cool. Good to know. I'll go and edit that slide. Um, so if you're here, you probably have some servers or access to servers or have some cloud, wherever the cloud lives. Uh, managing servers, apparently quite a big topic. Um, I hear some people have done that before. Um, does anyone know why all new vulnerabilities have to have a cool name? Has anyone figured that out? Was, was there an announcement at RSA I happily missed? Um, if someone can answer that, that would be really nice, because it's getting really boring. Um, uh, I'm sure if any of you have worked in operations, you'd be like, yeah, this is really cool. Look at that amazing uptime, 2,000 days. And that's why um, you're owned, basically. Um, so this is stolen from the, the RETTUD uh, presentation from Black Hat Europe. Oh, got too close to the mic. This shows the kernel vulnerabilities going up and up over time. The, the RETTUD was a uh, presentation of like, you can attack applications which have ASLR or write no execute, or you can just go and attack the kernel. And seeing as there are quite a few kernel vuns across all operating systems, if you can just own the kernel, then like, that's it. You don't have to worry about it. ASLR as much, because you've got right access to the kernel. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's a good, uh, good talk. I suggest you go read it. But that leads into everyone worrying about the uh, zero day attacks, because that's cool, and that's how you get funding, and that's how you go work for VPN, blah, blah, blah. Um, but like, if you have a 2,000 day uptime on your machine, why are you worried about zero day? If you have like, 
You have like 2,000 more days to worry about first. <laughs> um, and like, why there's, however, I know half dozen, dozen teams who can go out and write mad O'Day. There's like a few more who can write shitty 2,000 day. Um, <laughs> Actually, past the point, it probably gets harder to write 2000 Day because you're like, where am I going to get that copy of Linux? <laughs> Does anyone have a CD drive? Um, so, like, how can you, how can you uh, reset this dichotomy of worrying about panicking over O'Day because ThreatPost tells you to uh, and still having, like, uptime on your machines rather than just rebooting them every day, which operations people, some developers, probably some finance people, not so keen on. So uh, here's some of the stuff we've been looking at. Some of this will be familiar to you, um, and some of this we haven't yet done, so that's cool. Uh, SE Linux is a way of frustrating your sysadmins in the way that they can do nothing on their machine. Uh, anyone who's used SE Linux will have used the command set and force zero so that they can actually run what they're trying to run. Um, it's a kind of sandboxing and policy model. You say, Apache should never talk to these files, it should never run these system calls, and it's much more fine-grained than if you are UID zero, you can do whatever you want. If you're not, then you can't do as much. Um, we've got pretty far with that model, but SE Linux is a frustrating way of um, extending that model to be m more fine-grained. Um, there's an argument that, again, like once you attack the kernel, you just go to the bit that says turn off SE Linux. Cool, I'm done. Because uh, it doesn't do quite as much hardening in its uh, policy model. Um, the, a cool trick to do is enable SE Linux, put in all the policies, um, but not actually make it enforce, just make it log. So you get the Apache is for some reason running bin sh and talking over port 888, which it shouldn't do. Or I'm guessing shouldn't do. Maybe, I don't know how you run your web service. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a thing in Canada. You just use bin sh for your web traffic. Um, and then you, you put that in a log file, then you throw it in elk or whatever, and then you go, cool, that's bad, let's do something about that. Um, that's a more workable model than having SE Linux go, nope, you can't do a thing because a developer uploaded a new version and now everything's broken. There's uh, GR security or GUR security if you like Tigger. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, a set of hardening patches against the Linux kernel. Uh, it's written by a crazed underpaid guy who um, just releases new patches every time there's a new Linux kernel. Um, they do lots of actual hardening. Um, like every time a new vulnerability comes out in the Linux kernel, he really goes on Twitter going, yep, yeah, still fine. Um, and that's actually a way of making it more secure. Conversely though, you have to recompile Linux patches, which your operations people may tell you not, that they don't want to do for some reason. Um, Another, uh, another fun thing you can do is K-Splice, which is now owned by Oracle, which is the utter batshit idea of applying kernel patches without rebooting the machine by just splicing the changes into memory and changing the pointers that go to it. Um, the interesting thing here is you have to have something so important you can reboot it, but something you can definitely, definitely change the kernel memory of. Um, <laughs> It's like, this thing can definitely not, we can't reboot this, that would be critical, but like, cool, let's just stick something in here and see what happens. Um, <laughs> totally, totally fine. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out the only thing this could be good for is if you have lots of developers running Linux desktops and they never bother updating them. Um, I would say like, who's had a Linux desktop that hasn't crashed? Uh, this leads me on nicely to my next round of, um, I don't know if you can read this, but this is uh, a Red Hat Great, MySQL announcement, with a list of unspecified vulnerabilities. Oracle don't know their own bugs that are reported to them. Why are you trusting them with your kernel memory? So annoying, all the bug updates just go, yeah, an unspecified uh, vulnerability here that could be used to remote code or DOS something. You're like, any, any clue as to what? They're like, severity, nope. Um, another option, um, is you can, uh, you can run OpenBSD, which has only had two holes in a heck of a long time. Uh, but I don't think anyone is gonna go full Calgary on their entire cloud infrastructure if you can indeed run OpenBSD on cloud. Does anyone know that? No one's tried. Um, I present to you a fifth option. You can just reboot things. But <laughs> uh, or if you use AWS, you can wait for them to reboot them at random times and not tell you when that's gonna happen. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> but no one reboots databases because uptime. 
um, caches. Um, so the thing is, there will always be unpatched machines because who's going to, you, you're not going to reboot that database server. You're not even going to log into it. You're too scared. Everyone is. Um, breaches will occur. Um, I, the US has had some exciting breaches recently. Luckily, PCI protected them, so they're fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, and knowing that you've been breached is more important than living under the false pretense that you're never going to be breached. Um, it's certainly why I drink at night. Um, it's, so having awareness is much more useful than, than going, yeah, I applied an update, I'm fine. You can even, if you want to worry about O-Days, now's the time to do it. So one of the cool things we've got is we run Elk, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and we have, can anyone see that? I, this is not the best projector. In America, we have better projectors. Um, but they're all Comcast branded, so they're rubbish. Um, this is the output of commands running um, as root on a machine. And this is just using um, Linux's audit D framework, which is uh, built into the kernel. It does more than just command logging. This, it logs into any system call you wish. Uh, it outputs via the most horrible worst design system I've used. Um, and you hook into um, many different kinds of events. I'm just hooking into EXVEs uh, and then outputting them and then mangling them so that they're in a useful format and then throwing them into Elk. Um, I will open source that once I finish the bug. Apparently, Python isn't enough to keep up. Uh, so I'm going to have to do what everyone else does and rewrite everything in Golang. Because I'm cool like that. Um, if you don't want to use that, then uh, Mozilla have open source theirs, which is written in C because they're older than me. Um, <laughs> ThreatStack do a really nice one, which is all cloud-based, and you pay them money as a service, and that does more than just EXEV. Uh, the problems with it is it outputs multiple lines from a kernel, and then you have to read multiple lines and then tie them together with IDs because kernel developers have never used logs in their life. Um, which is just ridiculous. So the threat stack people have actually rewritten it and output it as JSON because that's what you have to do in 2014. Uh, here's a bunch of links. I didn't expect you to remember them. I'll probably share these links out and then you can go look at them whenever you wish. Um, but the being able to see commands running on every single machine in your entire infrastructure at once, just super powerful. Like five years ago, having that kind of visibility would just be like, how could I have that? I would have to tail bash history and pipe that into a thing over syslog and now you're like yeah or well, you can get it from the kernel that seems the better plan um, and, and we use that on both laptops and servers and it, absolutely mind-blowing do that data so if you're here <laughs> only one of them is big um, if you're here I'm gonna assume you have some data um, what, what, I, I love that one of them is in a kilt um, um, and so this is, this is an amazing screen grab from the amazing film Sneakers, which you should all watch. Um, and this is related to backups. How, you say? Don't worry, I'll get to that. Um, this is them bypassing the electronic key lock. So they've secured a door with an electronic keypad. Um, and the thing here is, like, so you have some databases. You probably have some ACLs on them. You're probably only able to access them from certain IP ranges or hosts, all of that good stuff. And then you run MySQL dump or whatever database you use, and then you just store them locally on the same machine or somewhere else. So if I was an attacker, I'd just go after the backups, because there's no ACLs on the backups. They're just sitting on a file system. Um, or they're sitting on another host with all the other backups and every backup of everything else. Like, why doesn't everyone attack backups? It's just, it's, backups are great. Um, so. I would say, if you are doing backups of your data, if you're not doing backups of your database, go and do that now. Uh, we're here till seven. Um, if you are doing backups of your database, please encrypt them. Um, and don't do it with a symmetric key that's stored in the same host, because that's just a slower way of doing unencrypted backups. Um, um, and like, put them on a machine that has at least as much ACLs as your um, database. Uh, like all our backup servers have Duo to FA to even get onto them, which is more than all of our database servers. Because apparently, getting web apps to do two FA is kind of hard. Um, some your DBA may argue that uh, restoring from an encrypted backup is a pain. Uh, I'm sure your liability people 
people will go, yeah, but having our databases on the internet is more of a pain. Uh, this is where you can game day it. Uh, if you think you're gonna be CPU bound on encryption, then you should buy some new hardware because AES has been in CPUs for a bunch of years now and it's no longer slow. So do that. Hi. Uh, um, don't worry, I'm not drunk. This is about canaries. Um, how awesome is that bad luck? Um, so what we've done is we've put a bunch of obviously fake data in uh, various places and then uh, using our proper IDS that aren't firewalls running on laptops, uh, looking for that on the wire. Of course, this doesn't work if, you if an attacker is like encrypting things out of there, but it does work if they're not, so it's worth doing. Um, so like uh, we have some TLS, ru uh, TLS rules, IDS rules, something end in, in, in S rules um, for spotting when LDAP goes in the clear for when certain database uh, strings go over the network, which should never happen in regular usage. And that's a, a really nice way of going, hmm, something has gone over my network that really, really shouldn't. We should probably go and investigate that. Um, it's really easy to do with just putting like, false records in, false users in, false passwords in of things, things you don't access. If you have a large data set, then put them at the start and then put them in uh, chunks all the way through so that like, if they try and do the top or the bottom of the database to just try and get some of it, you'll see it. Um, another cool thing we have is uh, our load balances. If they ever see um, real code, or in our case, PHP code, go over, be returned from a web server, then to drop that node immediately, because you never, unless your GitHub wants to return code out your load balance, so you're like, yeah, that's probably bad. Um, so it's another cute way of things you can do with canaries, of dropping connections as soon as they start sending things you shouldn't. So to conclude with some ducks. Um, Modern desktops still blindly trust the uh, network. Uh, they will trust name of servers. They will trust um, DHCP servers. They will trust anyone sending them router advertisements um, because th then home networking becomes easier. Um, you can exploit this or you can use this to your advantage depending on who pays your bills. I suggest you do one or the other. Um, servers like don't have to run blind anymore. Um, the person who was talking first about having multi-user systems and not knowing who was owning what from them. Well, now we're actually at a stage where if you throw the right tools at it, you can see every command executed on every single machine in your fleet in real time, near enough real time. Um, you don't have to run blind anymore. Um, and be careful with data, uh, and it will be careful with you. Uh, make sure you know when your data leaves the building without having to spend stupid amounts of money on DLP products, because if you saw the talks at Black Hat, they're all terrible. Cool. Any questions? <laughs> awesome. No questions. You got free time. <laughs>